welcome to today's panel on 2D animation and video game development. For today's conversation, I have invited three guests from studios which have recently published games made using 2D assets animated by artists working with Toon Boom Harmony. So let's go around the table for introductions. How would you describe your studio and what your day-to-day -day role there entails? Let's start with AJ. Hi, yeah, yeah. Um, my name is AJ Grand Scrutton. I'm the CEO and Creative Director at Delala Studios. Um, so we are a, a, a small studio out in Essex of about 26 people. Um, and we kind of specialize in 2D hand animated, hand animated video games. Um, our kind of big one we just did was Battletoads, which was 13 different genres. Um, so I wouldn't say necessarily we have a genre we sit in. Um, my day to day is really kind of uh, keeping the vision for our products, um, signing off all the, the assets as they're going in game and making sure kind of the team is all working towards a centralized goal. All right. And Alexandra, tell us a little bit about yourself and your studio. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Alexandre Boyer. Uh, I work at uh, Thunder Lotus as, the, uh, as an animation uh, director. Uh, Thunder Lotus was founded uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, we all uh, were coming from a mobile games or TV and film background, and we wanted to do uh, things that were more uh, personal to us. So then we uh, started with uh, Jotun, and then we did uh, Sundered, and uh, recently Spiritfarer. Uh, now we're uh, 30 people, about uh, 30 people, um, and separated in two teams. So we're trying to do uh, two games at the same time, but I cannot talk about uh, our current project. Uh, my day-to-day -day is I work, uh, I direct from one to two animators, depending on the project, but I still spend uh, most of my time uh, animating uh, myself. And Eric, what can you tell us about Double Stallion and yourself? Yeah, so my name's Eric. I'm the creative director at Double Stallion Games. Uh, we're also based out of Montreal. Um, we've been always doing uh, 2D games, uh, starting with, uh, we started in the mobile space with Big Ash and Megafight, which at the time was the first sort of uh, classic brawler adapted for mobile. Um, and then more recently, we made a game for consoles called Speed Brawl, which is a high speed uh, hybrid of like combat and um, racing. So like it's like time trials and fighting. We've also worked with a lot of partners, uh, such as Cartoon Network on an OKKO OK game, um, and more recently Nickelodeon on a Loud House game. Uh, and at this very moment, we're working with Riot Forge on uh, Convergence, a League of Legends story, which is a brand new game spinoff uh, from the League of Legends world featuring uh, Echo, who's like a time rewinding champion. Mm -hmm. uh, my day to day is, uh, well, currently is just like kind of leading the team creatively on, on Convergence. Uh, previously, I used to work uh, more just like on the art as an art director uh, with our previous titles. Uh, but I've moved up to uh, creative just to, to kind of help gear things uh, generally. Awesome. And Eric, um, what led your studio to specializing in developing 2D games? So from the start, um, you know, we started about eight years ago. And at the time, there were very few still uh, like high quality 2D titles that were not pixel art. And um, one of the thoughts that uh, you know I always had was that uh, I think pixel art games from the 80s and 90s that are very beloved today, uh, I feel like if you ask those developers at the time, you know, if they if they could have had the capability, they probably would have done um, all their animation like hand drawn. You know, they were sort of limited by the technology to to do everything in pixel art. And so part of the the drivers for Double Stallion, at least uh, on the art side was to sort of realize that dream and to uh, render games that you know look as seamlessly uh, as good as as animation you'd see on on television or in our films and so we're always striving to do that um, and you know part of the company's DNA uh, you could call it the double stallion uh, is that it's the, the the two stallions are the the art the strength of the art and also the tech which is a bit of the unsung hero that sort of supports the art because we have gigantic textures and gigantic sprite sheets um, but we're always sort of building up our pipelines to deliver better and better uh, art quality and and better games all right Alexandra, what drew your team to working with 2D animation and assets? 
Well, it's uh, mostly what came uh, naturally to uh, the artists at the studio and uh, what we're uh, really passionate about. Um, we we also talk, thought that it, uh, it will help, help us uh, stand out um, with uh, our visual style. But uh, yeah, it's just because we we come from a 2D background and uh, we love that stuff. And it wasn't more, uh, more complicated than, than that uh, for a decision. All right. And AJ, what drew Delala to working with 2D animation? Uh, yeah, I mean, we just love 2D animation. Um, you know, loved cartoons growing up, still love cartoons now. Um, really kind of we we found our feet and kind of stumbled onto kind of doing the 2D thing about three years into existing, so about 2015. Um, but for me, it's kind of just, you know, we're always looking to make playable cartoons. And I just, yeah, that that's kind of our passion. And so kind of it's just, just so happened that we got the right people in and kind of the team all merged together and the stuff we're doing is kind of is hitting that mark so that's yeah it's i think i think the other two guys on a call a lot more natural and more talented and came to it whereas i was just the nerd who liked cartoons who who found a bunch of very talented people to make some for me <laughs> oh that's uh, definitely a good situation to be in um Alexandra, I want to start with you with this question. Uh, broadly speaking, what are some of the advantages to developing a game using 2D animated characters and assets? Well, I, I think like uh, at the base of it, there's still something very magical to see a, a drawing that moves and that uh, are alive. Um, there are so many uh, great games coming out that uh, any way that you can stand out uh, as a studio, uh, it's just a, a big plus. Um, I think there are others uh, strengths specific to 2D, like there's a flexibility to 2D, uh, where like even if it's rig-based animation, in our in our case, we can always, if the rig doesn't allow us to do the poses that we want, we can always get out of the ring and just the rig and uh, draw what, what, what we need, which is something that might be uh, more difficult to do in, in 3D. And that's, uh, I think that's one strength of um, of 2D. Yeah, there's definitely like a real craft to, to 2D animation that I, I don't think anything can ever really replace. Uh, whether you're working with cutout animation, you're working with, uh, you know, hand-drawn frame-by-frame animation, uh, it really requires an artist to uh, devote attention to detail on all of the uh, character design and animation that goes into every frame that you see on screen. Uh, AJ, I wanted to ask you, uh, from your point of view as uh, a studio uh, head, um, what are the advantages to developing a game using 2D animated characters and assets? Yeah, I mean, kind of, you know, as we spoke about previously and what Alexander said there, it's, um, I, you know, it's kind of, it's more of a choice than anything. So I think kind of a lot of us do this from an artistic choice rather than an advantage. Um, but I think kind of what it really gives us is the freedom of expression. Um, what I will say is that that line between 2D and 3D is very thin now. You know, the Sony animation stuff, Spider-Verse, you know, Mitchell versus the Machines, like they're using 2D techniques left, right and center in those films. Um, but yeah, for me, it's being able to capture the humor, the, the over the top expressions, um, and there, there, there is, you know, as Alexander said, the magic of just being able to take a drawing and turn it into something moving. Um, and that kind of goes all the way back, you know, to early Disney, Tex Avery, Looney Tunes, like being able to still capture that stuff and bring it forward and do modern takes on it. Um, you know, that's, that's you know, it's less of an advantage and more of a, an, an incredible thing to be a part of. Yeah. And Eric, from your point of view, what are the advantages to making games using 2D characters and assets? So I think it's it's a lot of what Alexan and AJ were pointing out. Um, you know, there's a lot of exaggeration you can bring to 2D animation, which is just very natural to the medium. Uh, you know, I, I, I always think back to uh, when I was younger playing Aladdin, the, uh, the Virgin uh, Mega Drive Genesis uh, version, not the Capcom one. But, um, you know, when you'd like uh, jump on, like, say, like a camel or something and crush its hump, I would pause the game to look at all the like stretch frames and like deformed frames where they could, they would just go wild. 
Um, and you know, you can do that in, in 3d of course, uh, as well, but, um, I always sort of, and I've done some 3d animation as well in the past, but I always feel like you're kind of at the mercy of the rig and how it's like built. Uh, whereas if you're just drawing, you can kind of do, uh, almost whatever you want. Uh, but beyond that, I think for double stallion where we land is that 2d feels like a kind of, um, a shortcut to getting like really clean, bold graphics that uh, from a player point of view are just like, can be really like easy to read and understand. And, and uh, we feel it can actually like help gameplay, uh, especially in things like like side scrollers. Uh, so for us, it's, it's, it's a benefit in that sense. So if you have like characters that are 3D that are sort of in perspective that could break silhouettes, make things unclear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, there's a lot of games that are kind of working around that in 3D, uh, and, and I really admire them. And we're certainly not opposed to uh, moving to a 3D pipeline for, for certain titles there. It's really going to depend on the game. Uh, but for now, a 2D just uh, suits us best. So we talked about all of the things that we really like about uh, 2D animation games. Uh, I think we should also talk about some of the reasons why uh, some studios uh, might not be using 2D animation uh, right now. Uh, so, so what are challenges that you need to consider and, and really think about when creating 2D animated characters and assets for games? And we'll start with you, Eric. So um, I guess the biggest thing is is sort of uh, texture sizes and like things like sprite sheets, which can get like out of hand really quickly. Uh, artists will always want to just draw, 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 and just like add tons of frames. And then um, the tech team is just has a heart attack uh, about like all the stuff they need to optimize. And this is kind of a constant battle uh, for us, as I'm sure it is for for everyone here. Um, but you know, beyond that, uh, I think it could, like sprite customization can sometimes be challenging. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that, you know, we're, we're, we're speaking mostly about, uh, I feel like, a really frame by frame animation, but there are 2d forms of animation, uh, such as cutout, which don't necessarily, uh, have as many of the disadvantage. There's certain trade-offs of course, with the, the aesthetic. Um, so that's why at double styling, we're always trying to strike a balance where, you know, we'll do all our rough animations hand drawn, but then we actually still build rigs when we do cleanup. And so we have certain shortcuts where we'll reuse certain assets and stuff um, so that we get a bit of the best of both worlds to mitigate uh, some of the some of the weaknesses. And this also helps us with uh, uh, with optimization by by packing the sprites more efficiently and stuff because they're actually broken out into different pieces. Yeah, I think your point about like texture memory is, is a really good one, especially because the the jump from HD to 4K is not just um, doubling the amount of pixels that are on screen. It is kind of multiplying it by four <laughs> because you have the width and also the length um, or the, the, the height, I guess. Uh, so, so there has to be uh, that data has to be stored somewhere. Um, and even as hardware gets more powerful, uh, memory still has a limit somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Alexa Alexandra, do you feel that there are uh, challenges that you need to consider when animating characters and assets for games? Uh, yes, like, like uh, Eric sa says, um, uh, memory is always a big issue. Like on all our games, we really pushed uh, what we could do uh, to the limit of the, the consoles at the time that our, our games uh, came out. Uh, other than that, uh, yes, customization is uh, less natural to 2D. You can do some stuff uh, when the, the animation is rigged, but it's still a lot uh, easier in 3D in general. Um, one other thing is that when you are sprite-based, there's a lot of uh, things that like 3D will allow like uh, in-engine blending between poses and animation, while in um, 2D and drawn, you we have to uh, draw the transitions ourselves. And also like details, like if you have someone that runs with a gun in, in its end in, the, in 3D or in a rig, you can pretty much have it run and then have it angle the way that you're shooting. But if you're sprite based, well, you got those sprites, so you like having that tilt uh, from the hips uh, is not really uh, doable easily in a 2D. 
And uh, lastly, one other thing that uh, can be hard is to find the expertise. Like um, some of uh, our game, uh, there's a very specific style to it. That's an hybrid between cutout animation and uh, classical and drawn animation. And find people that are uh, comfortable in that style is not always easy. Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge. But we, we've been very uh, lucky uh, so far to have found some uh, very uh, talented people to work with. But each time we need to find someone, it's, uh, it's quite a, a process. Yeah, I mean, as you say, like with with cutout animation, there's some things that you can do uh, where you can have uh, different elements that can be pieced on top of each other. But if you're doing everything uh, traditionally hand drawn, uh, if you want to have an animation where a character like cancels out of a certain movement, you have to draw it, and I have to draw every instance of that animation for every character. So I, I can see how that could be really challenging in a lot of ways. Uh, AJ, do you have any thoughts on what you need to consider when creating 2D animated characters and assets for great for games? Yeah, I mean, it, it really kind of it, it varies genre to genre, right? Um, so kind of obviously, it's it's all about kind of what you're looking to achieve. Like obviously, when we're designing characters for platforming games, looking at kind of body proportions is very different. You know, for a game where this is seventy, isn't about jumping. Um, when we're doing battle toads, obviously. We had the 13 different genres in there. So we actually had completely new sets of sprites for the platforming sections and the combat sections. And um, you know, when designing the characters and looking at how we're going to handle the animation, it all comes down to purpose completely. It all comes down to what does the player need to see, what are we looking to achieve. Um, but whatever we're doing, the main thing is responsiveness. Um, it's very easy, not just for the animators, but for me as creative director, it's very easy to focus on the animation. And you could very easily end up over animating. Um, we threw away a lot of frames on Battletoads because we made these amazing looking animations. We got them in game and we were like, oh crap, I've pressed a button and it took me a second for that animation to play out. We can't wait a second for that animation. So we're going to have to cut out all of these frames. Um, I think I made our production staff quite angry with how many frames I threw away, uh, some of which I threw away after they'd already been painted. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of, it's all about purpose, what you're looking to achieve with the game, what you want the, the players to feel and how responsive the game needs to be. Yeah, so AJ, you just mentioned that Battletoads has, how many genres are in that game? I think it's 13. It was something stupid like that. 13, I think, yeah. Do you feel that certain genres are more closely associated with or suited to 2D characters and assets than others? I, I think there's definitely a perception of that being the case. I think, obviously, I think when most people think of 2D, they think of platforming games, side-scrolling platforming games. Um, but I don't think it necessarily has to be the case anymore. Um, you know, we had that fantastic conversation earlier in which we spoke about the variety of genres now attacking it. Um, I'm not going to step on Alexander's answer because he can give that. But what I will say is that, um, you know, I think now your choice of 2D and 3D is very much an artistic choice rather than a, a forced choice. You know, platformers can be 3D and traditionally 3D games can be 2D. Um, so I think now it really just comes down to kind of what you're looking to achieve, what you've got the team to do and kind of stick into that vision. Yeah, uh, so, so with that in mind, Al Alexandra, um, do you have any uh, opinions on uh, the way that uh, certain genres might be associated with 2D animation or ways that you can have 2D animation appear in unexpected places? Uh, yeah, well, it's not really a genre, but it's it's more like a side scroller in general just work very naturally with uh, 2D visuals because it's 2D gameplay and 2D visuals together. But I think that uh, Anything is poss possible. Like uh, you'd think that a first-person shooter game in with 2D assets would not work that well. But then uh, we have uh, Void Bastards recently that came out, and it, it works super well. And everything, uh, all the characters are end round. And if you go back to the old uh, first-person shooters, they were also like pixel art. Um, so everything is possible, and there's a lot of very good like. Uh, top-down game with a, with a perspective. We, we're starting to see more uh, 2D characters on the 3D perspectives. And uh, when the art direction is well made, it can work uh, very, very well. So, so yes. 
Eric, uh, do you feel that there are certain genres that are more closely associated with or suited to 2D characters and assets than others? Yeah, I mean, I I don't really have much to add on on what Alexon and AJ said, but what I would say is that I don't know. I guess there's certainly like more opportunities now, and I think there's there's more and more examples of 2D games and in, in perspectives that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, for us at Double Stallion, we try not to think of that first. We really start with the nugget of like, okay, what's the game's idea and what is its purpose? How is it, what is the experience, the player experience? And so if you're doing a game that's about, you know, like really kinetic punches and stuff, uh, you know, it's, it's like a martial arts film. You want to see the punches, you want to see things connect. So it just like, it works well to, to have like larger sprites or to be close up in a, in a, in a, a profile perspective so that you can see the silhouettes really clearly. Um, so it's, it really just depends on what it is exactly you're trying to do. But, you know, in the future, if we feel like a first person perspective is needed, then we'll figure that out. And if that can work out in 2D uh, with 2D sprites in a 3D space, then maybe that'll be it. And, you know, if we need to move into 3D, well, we're going to bring all that 2D expertise into how we build that 3D space. Um, and it's still at the end of the day, it's still going to feel like a double stallion experience and have that, that same like 2d DNA, if you will. Eric, I wanted to ask if you saw any trends around how 2d animated characters, uh, are, are being used in games. Uh, trends. I mean, I, I find the whole thing is is really a trend, right? I, I, I think the more games come out in in sort of non-pixel R2D, the more that developers are sort of keen on getting in there. And the more that developers get in there, the more that the, the tools get improved. Uh, when we started Double Stallion, there was very little... Uh, there were very little resources online uh, to, to help us out. And, you know, engines like Unity did minimal support for 2D stuff. Uh, same for, you know, um, art software and things like that. And now there's just like, every time there's like, like a big, big hit, like say a Cuphead or something, there's just more and more resources getting pooled towards these things. And I think that's just better for the, the, the ecosystem as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as specific trends, I mean, I, I just think they're just getting better and better. and um, it's uh, it's just really exciting to be part of that. Alexandra, have you seen any uh, trends or, or changes on how 2D animated characters have been used over the past five years? Yeah, I think that the main trend, uh, like Eric said, is that things like are, the quality is getting really, really good. I think there are a, a lot of artists that I've seen uh, that games can be a great way uh, to do something more personal than other uh, industries while still being able to make a living out of it. So there's a lot of uh, talent uh, trying to push the envelope in the, into the animation. Uh, technically, I think that uh, like we see more customization on uh, 2D rigs, we see more 2D animation in a 3D environment, but it's mostly the, the, the quality that is uh, standing out. And AJ, we were talking earlier about uh, like old LucasArts games like The Day of the Tentacle. Uh, how do you feel that the use of 2D animated characters has changed since those days? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think Eric mentioned earlier, kind of before the call, it was a, a good point he raised about when you look at a lot of the old games and how they were animated and what they looked like, um, it was due to restrictions of the time. And if they'd had the accessories to like the tech and things we have now, their games would probably look more like ours. Um, and I think that's very much like the Lucas games. I think, you know, they did that, right? They went back and they remastered Monkey Island. They redid Day of the Tentacle. Um, and you saw kind of those games through the lenses of modern animation techniques and kind of modern technology. Um, so I think really, like, I mean, let's be honest, we're all just walking in the footsteps they've left. Like, you know, that you know, the whole reason I make games is Day of the Tentacle. You know, every one of us that's making a platformer is taking something from a Mario game. Um, so I think kind of in terms of how animation's moved on, I think we're still using the exact same techniques. You know, some of us are still doing it hand-drawn, but we're doing it 
on a Wacom rather than on bits of paper. Some of the guys are doing it as rigged animation, and it's but it's still utilizing the same pose technique, the same approaches. Um, we've just got access to do it a lot better than you know when the guys were making Earthworm Jim and they had to scan in hundreds of thousands of bits of paper and then draw the pixels on top of it. That's a good point. Alexandra, I wanted to ask if you saw any differences between uh, the way that 2D games are made now and some of the older pixel art games, or, or if you feel that there's a lot in common with the two approaches. Uh, it's a good question. I think that a lot of time there's a lot in common. Um, of course, like now we have cutout animation in uh, multiple kind of softwares, that, and that's another process. But still, it takes a lot from the, the the classical animation. But I think there's still a lot of games that it's like you draw the roughs, uh, you put the placeholder in the game. Does that work? Fine. Okay, we do uh, the polished version of the animation with more drawings. And then you put it in the game, and that's it. And it can still be a very viable way to uh, do animation in a game. So it doesn't uh, change all that much uh, for that kind of animation. And Eric, do you feel that there are similarities or differences with hand-drawn uh, 2D animation or cut out animation and uh, the uh, classic sort of pixel art games uh, from the eight and sixteen bit eras. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I always want to be careful with those comparisons because I don't want to turn off any of my uh, fellow developers that have uh, pixel art studios. But um, I do. I always have this feeling of like a slight jealousy towards um, pixel art games because it's not to say. Like to me, they're just different mediums and interpretations of art, really. But I think that players have almost more of a forgiveness in terms of like the the frame fidelity and certain movements uh that you wouldn't necessarily have with like a fully drawn rendered hd character where you know there there's an expectation that they're gonna move like they would move in an animated uh cartoon whereas you know if there's like a bit of sort of frame skipping or quote unquote jankiness on a, a pixel sprite you'll sort of forgive it uh and so that I feel can lessen the workload um, for the artists involved. That being said, there's certainly some pixel art games with a ton of um, animation, animated frames, and and those are great too. And I play a lot of them. Uh, but if I had to make a kind of a difference between the two, uh, that's that's the one that sticks out to me from an animation perspective. Yeah, I, I remember uh, early in this conversation, I think Tophead was mentioned. And I, I think it's a really interesting example of a game that uh, really brought a lot of attention to the animation that went into it. Do, do you feel um, that there's more attention paid to the quality of animation and art inside games, uh, especially 2D games? And I'll start with uh, Eric. Uh, you mean like today as opposed to before? Uh, I, I think it, like today as opposed to a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, again, it's like that whole narrative about how there's more and more of these, these sorts of games coming out. Right. So it's, it's kind of like in, in the space and in the culture, uh, you know, in 2010 or 2000, uh, people were just looking to three, 2d just seemed like it was sort of old and it, there was nothing interesting about it. But I think if you talk to young players today, like kids and teens, if they look at a 2D game and then they look at a 3D game, they're just looking at two different kinds of games. They're not really thinking about, oh, this is like super old or, or not. Um, and I think that's really telling of like where we're headed, where it's just like, they're, it's just a space where, you know, some games are 2D and some are 3D, but ultimately like, is it fun? Do I care? Like that's, that's what you got to ask yourself, right? It's a good point, right? It, it's all different pieces that lead to uh, a final, uh, it, the product has to be the sum of the parts, right? Like if, if the experience doesn't uh, feel right, then it's it, it doesn't matter how good any one part of it looks. Um, Alexandra, I wanted to ask if you felt that there's been an increasing awareness of and appreciation for uh, the animation and art that goes into games. 
Uh, yes, well, speaking uh, specifically about uh, 2D animation, I think uh, there has been uh, an appreciation, appreciation of it more and more. Like uh, if we go uh, pr a bit of a long time ago, back in the PS2 times, I think that people were just putting aside 2D games or even like the first PlayStation to come, okay, 3D is the future. Anything that's 2D, that's just all, that's not interesting. And right now, people are seeing that hey, it's a different style. It's another flavor. And um, like, if you put that flavor on top of a great experience, narrative or gameplay wise, that that's that can be a super uh, legit uh, in itself. Um, well, well said. Um, and AJ, I want to ask if you feel that there's been an increasing amount of attention and interest in the craft of 2D animation in games. Uh, yeah, I think I'll kind of take a, a slightly different perspective to the others. I think um, I think the way with games in general is viewed, I think that developers appreciate it, internet trolls hate it, and the players don't really care too much how the sausage is made. Um, Cuphead is wonderful. We as developers adore it. You know, we as you know people who do 2D animation really appreciate the magic it brought. Um, I don't think players care too much. I think players think it looks cool. Um, I also don't necessarily think it was players that turned their backs on 2D during the 3D boom. It was publishers and platform holders who said, we've got new technology. We just want to use the new technology um, and then people stopped funding 2D games, which meant they kind of stopped being made. So players kind of forgot about them a little bit um, because I think, you know, people love 2D when it first came out. People love 2D for a long time. People love 2D when it came back. And I don't think that's because there was a middle generation that hated 2D. It was a middle generation that weren't given 2D because mm -hmm. publishers and platform holders wanted to fund 3D games to show off their, their polygon accounts and their new technology. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, it's kind of funny too, because if you look at like the PlayStation era of games, and I think there is a, a growing appreciation for some of the uh, low poly janky art from that, that time period. Um, but a lot of the games that really hold up from that era are 2D animated games uh, and also 3D games that really rely heavily on art style as opposed to being very simulation heavy. Um, I wanted to ask uh, AJ, uh, when thinking about uh, Battletoads, what character animations from that game are you the most uh, proud of or impressed by? All of it. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, I didn't animate it, so I'm not being egotistic. I genuinely think from an animation perspective, the team created a masterpiece in what they did. Um, like, I love the combat animations. There's some fantastic stuff with the morphs. I mean, you know, the stuff like pimple turning from a giant toad into a train. Um, like, you know, some of the stupid animations we had where Rash summons an old Battletoads arcade cabinet and plays it. Um, you know, my, my goal from day one for that project was to create a playable cartoon and the, the team just completely excelled at that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like I said to you before, ev every, every different genre in that game needed new animations, right? So there's combat, there's 2D platforming, there's behind over the shoulder bike racing, there's a random bit where you're bobsledding on the body of an unconscious diplomat and um all of that needed brand new 2d hand-drawn animations um so yeah i mean i'm just super proud of the team especially because besides our animation director no one on battle toads had ever animated a game before um so yeah like it was yeah i i love every single bit of that in terms of i mean i love every single bit of the game and i love all of the animation so yeah i'm afraid i'm, I'm completely biased to that answer that question Absolutely. Uh, Alexandra, um, when thinking about the uh, animation that went into Spiritfarer, what character animation were you the most proud of? Uh, it's so hard to say. Uh, like, um, uh, all of them uh, have something uh, special in them, and it's super fun to see people reacting uh, to the different spirits. Like, there are some people that really don't like one spirit, and then some people that love that that same spirit. And so it's really hard for me to pick uh, one in particular. There was um, there was uh, the uh, Edgehog uh, lady. 
um, that's uh, that was a bit special to me because uh, she she reminded me of my own uh, grandmother. But uh, other than that, uh, I couldn't pick one uh, specific character. And Eric, when thinking about recent games from Double Stallion, what character animations uh, would you say that you're most proud of? Uh, so in our game Speed Brawl, which is uh, like a, a brawler with like uh, co-op and, and uh, co-op gameplay, uh, we will really wanted to let players uh, have a chance to play as in different play styles as different characters. And uh, I guess just like the, sh the fact that we had six playable characters with full like combat rosters, and it's really a, a, a fighting game, a PVE fighting game. So there's a lot of moves, there's directional moves, um, special moves and all that. Um, just the, the animations, the sheer amount of animations for each character were, was quite high and we were still able to ship um, six characters. There was a seventh we had to cut, which um, I, I'm still sort of sad about. Uh, but I think in terms of amount and still maintaining the quality uh, with only uh, three core animators, uh, you know, I think that was quite a feat. But beyond that, um, something that we started really paying attention to from Speedrun on and that we're still doing today is uh, attention to detail with uh, visual effects and really keeping a hand-drawn component to all the like our, our punch impacts and like dust clouds and, and everything like that. Uh, with Speed Brawl, it was really um, almost pure hand-drawn, and now we're sort of experimenting with mixing the hand-drawn stuff with, you know, more dynamic particles and, and things, more traditional video gamey VFX, so that we can get something that's like super well-rounded and exciting. That's really exciting. And I, I also was thinking too that like when you're looking at uh, genres like fighting and uh, side scrolling beat em ups, th those are genres where players have always been paying a lot of attention to animation. Maybe not from a appreciating the craft of animation point of view, uh, more of a tactical point of view, but 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 still like they're counting frames. And I, I think any animator uh, would really love to see people pouring over every frame of their animation. Uh, so I think that's really exciting. Um, Eric, when did you realize that you wanted to work in game development? Uh, so, uh, yeah, my, my education background is, is in traditional animation, and uh, I wasn't sure, quite sure at the time when I was studying where I wanted to fit, but I knew that I wanted to do just exciting creative projects. Um, after graduation, I did work in the animation industry. I worked in commercials. I did compositing. I did all kinds of different things, uh, music videos and TV series. But uh, ultimately, I found the video game experience industry just more appealing in the creative opportunities that presented themselves. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to be from Montreal. So after school, I moved back to Montreal and there was a big industry there. Um, so I think what really just distracted me to games was, you know, the, just the sheer creativity with what was going on. Um, this was just after, you know, the peak of like uh, the Fez Meat Boy uh, combo. So there was just a lot of excitement in games that I wasn't really feeling on the anime in the animation industry where everything was sort of just established and focusing on, on mostly family entertainment and, and preschool entertainment. Uh, Alexandra, I, I want to ask you, uh, when did you realize that you wanted to animate for games? Well, uh, around the end of uh, high school, for me, I really didn't know what uh, I was going to do, maybe go in science, but I wasn't uh, too uh, passionate about it. But then I found out that there was uh, classes at the Cégep du Vieux Montréal where we could uh, learn uh, animation, whether 3D and 2D. And uh, it's a really great public school with uh, very good teachers. We're lucky to have it uh, in Montreal. Uh, so I actually, uh, my plan was to go in 3D, but I switched to 2D because I fell in love uh, with drawing uh, during the first year of, uh, of those classes. And, uh, yeah, and, and that SageUp is a really good school. It is one of the best animation schools in North America. And uh, the tuition is really inexpensive. Uh, so for residents of Quebec, uh, it is a really great uh, way of getting into animation. 
Yes, absolutely. Like, I don't know if there are many uh, other places uh, in the world where you, you can get like, affordable, um, affordable teaching like that uh, on uh, something specific like uh, animation. Right. And AJ, when did you realize that you wanted to work in game development? Uh, yeah, it's it's basically all I've ever wanted to do. Um, so yeah, you know, my parents got me a NES for my fourth birthday, and kind of that started my journey of loving games. And then playing Day of the Tentacle for the first time, which I played on a questionably acquired version via my friend Jam from school. Um, and you know that that really showed me what games could be. Like that was when I really truly fell in love with it. Though kind of that was always my goal. Um, you know, I always used to say that. Other kids wanted to be cowboys. I just wanted to be the guy making Mario. Um, so yeah, I kind of I went to university, got a degree in computer science, and got in via kind of programming. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my passion has always been just kind of trying to come up with the ideas and figuring out how to make them. All right, and uh, AJ, you mentioned that you uh, sort of started with a, a two guys in a garage model. Um, do you have any advice for anyone who wants to get started creating their own games and does it have to be in a garage? No, it definitely doesn't have to be in a garage. No, not at all. Um, yeah, I mean, look, that was, that was 2012. Uh, that was myself and my co-founder Craig. Um, we quit kind of our nice, nicely paid London programmer jobs to kind of, to start a company with no, no idea and no money. Um, and I think even in the nine years since we did that, things have come on a long way now. Like there's so many resources available online in terms of learning how to do it and there's lots and lots of people that want to do it now and it sounds crazy but you know 2012 was really the start of the you know the so-called indie boom um and so there wasn't that many people around trying to do their own thing you know mo most people were coming out of university and college and their goals were to work for a large studio to work for a valve to work for an activision um Whereas now the internet is full of people on Reddit and forums who all just want to make games, don't necessarily know how, um, but have that that spark and kind of it means you can kind of connect with people at a similar level and kind of come together and discover you know how awesome making games is. Um, so yeah, like I think my advice is just you know find the right people because that's really the only thing that matters. There's plenty of ways to make games. There's plenty of games to be made, but there's only a you know there's only a certain amount of people you're going to really connect with. So that's kind of the main thing. Alexander, I wanted to ask if you have advice for anyone who wants to get started animating for games. Uh, yeah, well, I agree with uh, everything uh, AJ uh, said. And I have an advice, but it depends a lot on the person. It's a very general advice. But I will say to try to start with something that's not too big in scale. Like it's better to make something small and do it really well than embarking on a project that needs a lot and a lot of content. You're going to learn a lot during your first few projects and you want to spend your time tackling those uh, design and gameplay obstacles rather than uh, churning out uh, content um, where you're not learning uh, that much in the end. Uh, kind of the, the game jam mentality. But again, that really depends on where you are uh, in your life. Uh, are you already a dev or so? But that's my advice. That's a good point. And I mean, that's sort of the thing with anything. Uh, when you're learning to animate, you, you, you sort of have a flower sack that does expressions uh, or, or poses. You, you don't start with a feature film. Um, Eric, do you have any advice for anyone who wants to get started creating their own games? Uh, games generally, uh, I guess it really, I don't know. I feel like I'd give a different response depending on the discipline. Um, if it's artists, uh, I always stress with artists that, you know, like I, I'll get questions sometimes where I'll like give a talk in front of students or something. And people often ask questions like, oh, what kind of software do you use to make your animation and, you know, all that. And, and software is there and is required to make game, game art, but it's really not the most essential thing. Like if you're, if your focus is to kind of just make quality games or, or get a get a get a job. I always stress to to put a focus on kind of art fundamentals. Uh, start by learning, 
you know, human anatomy and perspective and, and nail that stuff. The software, you can always kind of pick up. A lot of studios will just train you on it. But if you're a super, um, you have really strong art fundamental skills, uh, you're going to be really flexible and, and, and be able to do almost anything. Um, as far as getting uh, getting started in games generally, uh, it certainly helps to be sociable, which I know is not always a given for everyone. Uh, but you know, look in whatever city you live in, see if there's a community of you know game developers. Obviously, now is not the best time for in-person meetups, but uh, you know it may be starting. Uh, and of course, online there's a lot of people as well and, and resources. Uh, so just getting connected with other people that are interested in, in making games is, is, is always positive. And whether you're starting your own project independently or you just maybe you'll just meet someone who starts working somewhere and they can uh, recommend you, give you a reference, uh, that'll get your foot in the door better than, you know, uh, you know, a perfect CV, if you will. Eric, do you have any advice for artists who want to apply to work with Double Stallion? Yeah, uh, I just answered that. It's <laughs> I, I always look for the, the art fundamentals. Um, so I'm always like portfolio first, and uh, I just like try to see like what's the spark and what's the understanding below beneath everything. Um, it's not really about necessarily what you're drawing. It's just like, do, do you understand the basics? And if you're, if you need to learn Toon Boom Harmony because you're not super familiar with it, well, you know, maybe that's not going to matter because you understand uh, how to draw a, a figure and you understand like the basics of movement and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, Alexander, do you have any advice for artists who want to apply to work with Thunder Lotus? Uh, yes, I think that uh, artists uh, need to come in with the mindset of uh, teamwork and uh, being ready to the more uh, iterative approach of video game. Like in TV and film, it's very linear. You have script, storyboard, layout, posing, animation, compositing. In video game, it's a lot of back and forth, trial and error, errors, a lot of uh, discussion about where to go next. You need to always think about how your works fit with the work of the other departments. Uh, it's a bit of an in intangible, uh, but having that mindset and the motivation to work that way uh, makes a, a big difference. That's very good. I should have said that. Very true. And AJ, do you have any advice for artists who want to apply to work with De La La? Yeah, I mean, look, the other two have given fantastic answers to this already. So what I say will just be a derivative. But, um, you know, building on Alexander's, it's... Um, Making games is not the same as making art, especially from an artistic perspective. Learning to not be precious, learning when to move on, and understanding that you may put your heart and soul into something and then it gets cut and you don't have any control over it. Kind of just prepare yourself for those kind of things. Um, it's very, very different, you know, creating a perfect image than it is creating an image that has to actually take place in a game. Um, and that's a really hard skill to master and you'll learn it on the job. So I'm not saying that artists need that. I'm more saying artists who haven't done games before need to be prepared for that. That, you know, depending on if you're a concept artist or a production artist or a designer, um, you know, there'll be elements of your role which aren't the same as just being able to draw amazing pictures. Um, it is understanding how that picture is going to take place in the game world. So we have about 10 minutes left in this call. Uh, I wanted to ask... AJ, um, where can we learn more about your studio? And do you want to tell us a little bit more about Battletoads? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, you can go to DalalaStudios.com or, you know, Twitter slash Delala Studios. Um, there's plenty of talks I've done online on YouTube if you want to hear me talking crap for an hour or so. Um, so please go ahead there. Um, and yeah, look, Battle Toads, the best way to kind of see it is to play it. Um, it's on Game Pass uh, if you've got Xbox, and I think that's on, you know, last gen and this gen. You can get it on PC and Steam as well, but it's it's just a stupid game. It's what we call kind of a popcorn game. It's not a sit down and play for 15 hours. It's going to be four to six hours of your life. It's got 30 minutes of fully animated uh cartoon cutscenes in it you know also done in toon boom um you know a lot of the animators from teen titans go did the cutscene stuff with us um and it's just 
a silly adventure about three characters and a game franchise that are no longer relevant because it's been 26 years since the last one and it's kind of a story of those characters and us as developers kind of coming to terms with that and trying to figure out how to make ourselves relevant again um so yeah it's it's just a stupid game all right and alexandra where can our viewers learn more about your studio and is there anything you want to say about spirit fairer uh well it's spirit Ferrer and all of our games are uh, uh, disponible accessible on uh, pretty much every uh, console on pc and uh, mac i think um and uh, yes a spirit Ferrer is uh, basically um it's like the myth of uh, caron from a greek mythology where you play the Ferrer of souls that needs to uh, help uh, people uh, go um to the uh, odala um so it's about um trying to make peace uh with death and having to uh let go of people that are uh, dear to us and um but it's also a, a very colorful game uh, there's a, there's humor in it and it's not a somber look at, at death so it's uh it's there, there's like a serious aspect to it but at, at the end of the day we it's still a fun game i think so it's a, it's a particular game. I think that for some people, it won't uh, be the thing that they, they like. But uh, like, if you can just have a look on the YouTube with the trailer if uh, people are interested. Yeah, I've heard it described as a cozy game about death. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that, that's the, the pitch that I was trying to remember. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And Eric, uh, is there anything that our viewers should know about well, where, where can our viewers learn more about Double Stallion games? And uh, do you have anything you want to mention about any recent games that you've made? Sure. Um, so yeah, check out our website at dblstallion.com. Uh, we've got all our games there, although unfortunately OKKO OK is no longer available, but through uh, no fault of our own, that's a Cartoon Network property. But you can check out Big Action Mega Fight on Steam, um, and we've got Speed Brawl uh, also available on, uh, recently was released on Epic, it's also on Steam, it's on PS4, um, Xbox, like previous all previous gen uh, consoles. Um, Speed Brawls, you know, if you haven't heard of it, it's a super exciting um, uh, combination of like high octane combat with like time trials. So it's really like an arcade brawler where you need to build up flow and momentum uh, and go as quickly as possible to get the most um, income for your characters, which you then spend on tech trees and, and items to, to upgrade and unlock new characters. The game is um, available in co-op up to two players. It can, you can also play online. It's a great game to play with friends. If you love brawlers and your friend's not too sure, bring them in. It's 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 really good to sort of like uh, get someone get someone in there because you're helping each other out. You're not playing against each other. Uh, so currently, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, we're working on Convergence, a League of Legends story. Still not too much info about this title yet. You can check out the teaser on our website, or you can go to uh, riotforgegames.com. Uh, just stay tuned uh, for you know the next time there's an update about the game. Uh, I can't say much else. All right. Well, with that in mind, uh, thank you everyone for joining this week's discussion on 2D character animation in game development. And for our viewers, if you are interested in animating for games, and, and I saw a few uh, technical questions in the chat, so I'd encourage everybody to uh, stick around for next week. Um, but be sure to visit toonboom.com slash gaming for game dev resources, such as our new SDK for importing character animation directly into Unity. And if you're handy with the source code, it can also be customized for your own projects. Next week, we'll be learning more about animating for game development in Harmony Premium. We'll be taking a close look at game animation features with Marie-Ève Lasselle and Alexi Duclos. I'm looking forward to our conversation, and I hope that you all join us. Until next time.